Well, welcome, welcome to uh, the <laughs> School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. We have a uh, real treat for you today. Hi. Jerry, up. no. Hold up <laughs> this man has been harassing me <laughs> since I met him in 1967. <laughs> this is not an amplifying microphone. This is just for those people. <laughs> so we are here today to give our blessings to Jerry Dobson for flying all the way here from Knoxville, Tennessee to fill this room with great, wonderful people, some of whom are in my class. Maybe you were in my class too. I have no idea what they're going to say, Jerry, but I'll try to find out what you say. We started the Energy Specialty Group in 1979 uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, and Jerry was at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory at the time. And he was there for 27 years. And then he uh, decamped from there because he wanted to experience the, the pleasures of Kansas. And so he went to uh, the university there because the basketball team was not as, not as good as Tennessee's women, but it was pretty good. Uh, and uh, he was there for 14 years, and now he's emeritus and back in Knoxville, Tennessee. So we have him for a few days. Uh, Jerry was president of the uh, American Geographical Society for 14 years, and he was uh, substituted for me in 1983. So he is uh, familiar to some of the the older people who are here, and I won't even point you out, Pat Gober and, uh, and, 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 and Tony back there, and Brendan. <coughs> Malcolm, God, you were, you were really old, Malcolm. <laughs> so we're going to hear from him today talking about um, one of his favorite topics. I must say that I think Jerry is one of the um, geographers that I'm most proud of. He's, he's written papers on a variety of topics, including um, iodine uh, and uh, what do you call that? Lack of iodine. Well, iodine deficiency. Iodine deficiency in Neanderthals. And, he has a, uh, put out a new theory about continental drift. He's done work on acid rain. Uh, he's done a whole variety of other things. But lately, he's been working on what he called Aquaterra. And he's going to be talking to you about that today. Uh, and it's a very exciting topic, which we will, um, which you'll be getting into. But if you think about all the flooding that's going to be going on as the global warming continues, uh, this is uh, the area that was the, that emerges and goes and submerges over the, over the thousands and thousands of years. Jerry Dobbs, a good friend of mine. Glad to have you here, Jerry. Thank you. It's yours. Thank you. Well, this is really an honor to, especially to have such a crowd here today. Thank you. I mean, and uh, I, as Mike said, I have such fond memories of being here in 1983. And I've been back a number of times since then. It's one of my favorite. Well, it is my favorite university, I have to say that. Um, I'm going to talk about four different topics today. Uh, just a short intro about the relationships between geography and oceanography over time. And then I'm going to spend a few minutes on a paper that I wrote in 2014. Uh, I actually named it Aqua Terra Incognita Lost Land Beneath the Sea. That was in the Geographical Review. And I'll just talk about that enough to sort of re refresh, your, refresh you or, or introduce you to some concepts there. Um, then I'm going to cover a paper that we are working on right now. We've submitted it on travel, transport, and trade at the last glacial maximum, which 20, was 20,000 years ago. And then there's a final one part that I'm going to talk about one place within Aquaterra, and it really illustrates how great an impact this has and how important it is for us to understand what Aquaterra really was. Geez, this is not popping right. Okay, uh, if you look at Merriam-Webster, you see that the first known use of the word oceanography in English was in 1859. Anybody have any idea what it was called before that? The Physical Geography of the Seas. Uh, 
it was, the term oceanography first appeared in Germany and then spread here. Now remember that year, 1859, and I'm going to show you a little vignette. This is a 15-year period in the mid-1800s at the American Geographical Society, and these are officers and counselors. We had Matthew Fontaine Maury, who was one of the founders of oceanography, one of the most uh, influential oceanographers of all time. We had Samuel F. B. Morse, who invented the telegraph. Anybody know who his father was? Nope, Jedediah Morse, the most prominent geographer of the early American period, right after the Revolution. Oh, actually, Samuel F. B. Morse ran for president of the American Geographical Society, probably to show up his father, because he was a really obnoxious guy. And uh, he won. But he was so obnoxious that the counselors found a way to get rid of him in a technicality. And the technicality was that he had never paid his dues. So <laughs> he would be one of my predecessors as president if he had paid his dues. Uh, I paid mine. <laughs> uh, and the third person was Cyrus W. Field, who was the developer of the uh, transatlantic telegraph cable. So these three guys got together. And I don't know how much of a role the AGS played in that. I just know that they were all there in the year 1859, and that was the beginning of the transatlantic telegraph cable. And Maury, his contribution was to help Field know where to place the cable so that it wouldn't um, break as often, where the, break, uh, the breaks would be less because of tectonic and other stresses. In 1855, Maury wrote one of the most influential texts of his day, The Physical Geography of the Sea, still under the geography title, and then that became one of the founding documents for the formation of oceanography. Uh, soon after that, geographers ceded the oceans to oceanographers and the atmosphere to atmospheric scientists, who knows what else. But the oceanographers have been gracious about it. You look at, uh, this is, I just pulled a, a curriculum for a, an oceanography introductory course uh, off of a line. I found others like this. They put geography in there as one of the contributing disciplines. Conversely, if you look in physical geography textbooks, we simply think of oceans as a different place to study. And that's perfectly reasonable from our perspective. Not to say that geographers don't study the oceans. This was a special issue of the Geographical Review in 1999 and another article by Martin Lewis uh, 10 years later. And what you see is geographers particularly bringing a human perspective to the oceans. The uh, Moscow State University, I visited there in 2012, they have 15 departments of geography, and one of them is oceanography, or oceanology is what they call it, but it's the same thing. It's been there, uh, it would have been that way before 1850 here. There are only a, a couple of, well there are four institutions that I was able to find where geography and oceanography are combined in a single unit. University of Liverpool, Bangor University in the UK, uh, University of New South Wales, and Oregon State University as a college of earth, ocean, and atmospheric scientists. And there may be others. It's a little bit hard to search for that. Uh, interesting that even though there are only four in the world that I was able to find, two of them are only 14, 114 kilometers apart. Now this is the curve that got me going. If you, uh, this is sea level, and know that anytime the oceans are advancing, the glaciers are retreating. So this is the, uh, magnitude of glacial advance and retreat, ocean advance and retreat in inverse order. And you'll see that it's only been its present depth twice since the earliest humans appeared. Once when they appeared and today. Now this is what's interesting to me. If you ask what's normal sea level, for 104,000 years, the oceans were 25 meters lower than today. 
That means that's much more t closer to the normal than what we view today. It's 87 percent of the time that humans have existed. If we go down to 68 meters, it was that low for 59,000 years. 85 meters for 35,000 years. And if we go down to 100 meters, it was that depth for 12,000 years, which is equivalent to twice all modern, all recorded history. And that means there was a lot of time for some mischief down there, and we, we hope we caught it in the archaeological record, but there's no really, not really any reason to think we did. And I say this is Earth's greatest scientific clue regarding human origins, evolution, and cultural development. I don't know how any discipline can study the topics of, for example, evolutionary biology without understanding what was happening with the rise and fall of the seas. And look at the, the area that is covered. It is enormous. Uh, and this is an equal area map that I'm showing it on here. Um, Aquaterra. I, I looked at the world and I saw we had several of them already named, several of the places named, Ber Beringia, Doggerland, Sunderland, Sahul. And I said, why not name the whole feature? Sometimes it's land, sometimes it's water. So I named it Aquaterra. Um, it is equivalent to South America in size. So this is as if we lost a continent. It is entirely flat, entirely coastal, and mostly <clears throat> tropical. It would have been the best place to live during the ice ages. So Aquaterra is a vast global realm that is sometimes land. I need an A there, don't I? Sometimes, I, and I got an S, extra S on the next one here. Sometimes water, sometimes coastal wetland. Pulling a Marco Rubio here. So I wrote this article. I think it may be the first time anyone ever looked at that feature comprehensively, holistically. And I urge scientific recognition of an existing, previously undefined and unnamed global feature. It is a physical feature that doesn't need humans to justify it, but it also happens to be the ancestral home of humankind. All of the biological indicators suggest we came from an aquatic environment. It is the geographic equivalent of the Anthropocene. Think about it that the Anthropocene tells us when humans influenced the Earth. This tells us the maximum extent to which they influenced the Earth, spatially. So I call for extraordinary uh, exploration, uh, collaboration uh, the exploration and scientific investigation of Aquaterra will require geographers and oceanographers and many disciplines related to each. Neither profession alone is adequately equipped to address the dynamic physical ocean below sea level and the dynamic physical and human world above and beside it. For instance, geographers are accustomed to mapping and analyzing road networks and settlements, but not 3D columns of ocean water. Oceanographers are accustomed to studying currents and corals, but not sequent occupants by humans. Geographers map, oceanographers chart, and many cartographic concepts differ between them. Geographers design geographic information systems to suit their needs and have been using GIS intensely for decades. Still, we need major advances in data structured 4D geovisualization analysis and with chronology as well as topology integrated through process models simultaneously representing marine and terrestrial phenomena. A tall order indeed. Uh, Don Wright, chief scientist at ESRI, personifies the type of collaboration that's needed and she's leading a consensus building forum of how ESRI's ArcGIS should evolve to meet the needs of oceanography. It's a very complex thing to conceive. And so my brother and I got together and wrote two novels that help explain it in a uh, Socratic method. Um, we, the, the Waters of Chaos on the left there is called The Modern Quest. And that is uh, 
a, a modern story of a scientist working at a national laboratory, as I was at the time, who gets suspicious and starts searching for what may have existed beneath the sea. The other one is uh, an imaginary story of people living in that time and facing the global catastrophe of sea level rise. Well, I thought I had hit pay dirt. I, I think I did uh, with aqua the word aqua terra when I found this blog by a Swedish, uh, Danish blogger. Um, he said the name, just say it out loud. Savor the word. Sounds great, doesn't it? Tastes good, alluring, adventurous, puzzling. One can only be curious about what mysteries lie hidden in that name, I thought, when I read about this fascinating concept of Aqua Terra. And it comes with great authority. He says he's a nerd, hubby, father, and politician, mostly goes into substandard pop culture science fiction. That's me. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, another reaction, a much more important one that I received, there was a new textbook that came out uh, on the birth of the Anthropocene, and the author, Jeremy Davies, Davies acknowledges the, the lands given the name Aquaterra, a vast earth feature which transformed back and forth among upland, wetland, and seafloor as the ocean gives and takes like a vast millennial tide. Those are my words. But um, so he used the word aqua terra, and he even goes a step further and introduces a new term, aqua terrains, to re refer to those individual Doggerland, Beringia, and so forth. The most important one, however, was a team of oceanographers from Italy, uh, Urbino University in Italy, Speta and Galassi, who um, decided they would uh, respond to a, a call I had made in my paper saying that we needed to adjust those depths and, uh, and areas for isostatic pressure. That's a, a modeling, well, I'll show you how that's done in a minute, but um, they refined the boundaries of Aquaterra worldwide and then more specifically in Beringia and Doggerland. Now, when you introduce a new term like that, you would be happy if it showed up in the dinkiest uh, journal. Uh, just somebody recognize it, use it. But this is in Comprendu, which is one of the seven journals of the French Academy. It's been publishing since 1666. So I was gratified to see it there. Um, okay, now what they're bringing to it is glacial isostatic adjustment. There are two types of pressures that affect sea level. One is eustatic, which is just a matter of volume. Sea level, level rises or falls. Think of that as water in a, a nice rigid cup. But the isostatic, uh, think of that as a cup that has uh, soft places and hard places. It's flexible. It can move in and out. And so, you, so you don't get a linear relationship between volume and area. In glacial rebound, we, we see this all the time. We can understand that when ice weights down a seafloor and then the ice melts, it can rebound. But the same thing is happening with water in the ocean itself. So you see instances like this where it pushes down uh, but, or it doesn't push down as far because that uh, geologic formation is more rigid. So this is... The composition of their model, I'm, I don't want to take the time to go through it in detail. I'm just going to give you a quick summary. It has a sea level equation in it. They reconstruct paleo topography. Uh, they have ice sheet chronology after Lambeck, an equal area grid, and a 500 year time step. The data that go into it, they have density of the geologic structures beneath, rheology, which is malleability of geologic substrate, measures of spherical elasticity, the present topology, and a raster surface, surface and ice sheet geometry. So uh, what, I already said this, they created a, uh, refined the boundaries globally, and in these two regions, 
I just this morning received an article, the new a new map of Beringia opens your imagination to what the landscape looked like 18,000 years ago. And what that fellow is doing, he's a geologist with the Yukon Geological Survey, and he is recreating the land cover and where the streams would have been and where the glaciers would have been on Beringia. He says he based it on the most recent um, ice, uh, sea levels, but I don't know, I couldn't find, but this afternoon I couldn't find whether they had done isostatic adjustment or not. I don't know if they did it to that extent. I, I would hope they got it from the article that Speta and Galassi wrote, but I don't know that they did. Now, um, I, I want to illustrate here the difference that that geoisostatic adjustment makes. If you look at um, the total amount of territory in Aquaterra, that is 24 and a half million square kilometers. With geoglacial isostatic adjustment, that drops to 17.5. So I had originally said that it was equivalent to the area of North America, but the new calculation drops it down to South America. So, so you can see how, what a big difference this makes. Uh, although if you look at the distribution of it here, it's not making much difference difference in the distribution of it. My highest purpose was to encourage strategic thought and holistic research. Surely such enormous shifts of land mass configurations and aggregate land areas must cause corresponding changes in geographic patterns of travel, transport, and trade, migration, social interaction and communication, defensive posture, and other forces and factors that are fundamental to the human geography of each passing age. So, Speta, Galassi, and I had a sort of spontaneous collaboration there, and now we have written, uh, the three of us, have written a new article on today's glo global cho choke points and what they would have looked like at the last glacial maximum. We ask, what impact might the changing configuration of coast have had on local, regional, and global patterns of transport? We answer by comparing the global choke points of today with those of 20,000 BP during the last glacial maximum. If you pick up any world regional geography textbook, you'll likely see a list of global choke points. This is Bradshaw, and you'll see the Suez Canal, Straits of Gibraltar, Panama Canal, Straits of Hormuz, Bosporus, and Dardanelles, Straits of Malacca. And I felt that we needed to add the Bab al-Mandab at the southern end of the Red Sea. I don't know exactly why. They don't usually have it in there, but it's probably because it's overshadowed by the Suez at the north. And we added the Bering Strait. I don't think most people think of it that way today because it's nice and wide, but at previous times in history, it got very um, narrow at times. So a choke point is a point at which surface transportation routes converge with two major implications. First is that maritime choke points affect surrounding regions by funneling trade through narrow ocean route th throughways. Choke points are vulnerable to control by a dominant nation or coalition of nations. And global choke points hold additional significance because they impact worldwide transport and trade. So here are the global choke points in relation to Aquaterra. They, all, they are all either isthmuses or straits. So I'm going to go through those one at a time and show you how much it changed them by dropping sea level, essentially 130 meters. You see that uh, the Strait of Gibraltar went from 14 kilometers wide to 10 kilometers wide. That probably didn't have much effect on navigation. Maybe they had faster tides and currents, but it wouldn't have 
uh, stopped people from traveling through there. Make sure I'm on the right. Yeah. The Bosporus and Dardanelles divided into a land route with a, a lake, a, a lake in the center where the uh, Sea of Marmara is today. That was a lake. It's very deep. And there were times when precipitation was sufficient to fill the Black Sea Basin and overflow in which case you would have a river flowing down through there. At other times, there was not enough, and so you ended up only with a, a walking trail, land, land, uh, overland trail. And you can see here that when the, when the uh, land is dry and you're walking anyway, you might as well go over to this sea here rather than going all the way down to here. So that uh, means the, the shortest route would have been 265 kilometers compared to 300 kilometers today, but walking rather than sailing. These are not... The, the straight... This is not working right. Um, Straits of Messina and Sicily there was some suspicion that they might have actually split the Mediterranean Sea into two separate seas. But what we found is that, yes, the Strait of Messina was closed. No question about that. But the Strait of Sicily narrowed down to uh, about 36% of its current width. But, and there was always a channel at least 100 meters deep through that. The Bab al Mandab reduced from 25 kilometers wide to 3 kilometers wide. Again, it would have had faster tides and currents, but it wouldn't really have affected navigation very much. The, the, sea of, the uh, Strait of Hormuz did not exist, and neither did the Persian Gulf. The Strait of Malacca did not exist. It's, it's fairly shallow today, and especially in the eastern end. Uh, and it would have been connected to, uh, all right, there, there would have been no seaway for a thousand kilometers there. And then at the eastern end, that was Sundaland, so there wasn't even a way around it. And the Bering Strait did not exist. The Isthmus of Panama was two point well, two and a quarter times as wide as it is today. It would have been an ardu arduous journey, more arduous then than now. The interesting one is the Isthmus of Suez. The Gulf of Suez did not exist. So that became, instead of 150 kilometers overland, it became 520 kilometers, three and a half times as long overland. Now, does it matter how much maritime travel, trade, and transport long distance existed 20,000 years ago. Were, were there any boats? Was there any cargo? Was there any transport of cargo by boats? If so, how can ports and settlements be recognized today? So I went through a, a literature search. The oldest known uh, accepted proof, they don't have the actual boats, but there's a, a generally accepted that the first boats must have been available to Australians in 65,000 BP when they crossed over from Sundaland to Australia, Sahu. There was a well-developed unguent trade, Phoenician, uh, in 3,100 BP. And the earliest known boat with cargo is a boat in the Aegean Sea uh, near uh, the island of Dokos, uh, that was 4700 BP. So that's the earliest true solid evidence we have of transporting goods. But the cargo, there was pottery in China 20,000 years ago. And by the way, that number keeps changing. It, when I started writing this paper, it was 11,000 years. Oh, and then it was 15, and now it's 20. 
And uh, so there's a suspicious case here in that the Venus of Doni Vestinitsa in uh, the Czech Republic is dated 20,000 BP. It's the first fired clay object of any kind, and it's obviously more uh, technically difficult than making a pot or a plate. So I, uh, there's good reason to think there may have been pottery in that span as well. There was long distance transport of pigments and stone tools, and here we're talking about land transport, but imagine this going back 300,000 years. And even more shocking, Homo erectus appears to have moved stone tools to the island of Flores, suggesting that there was maritime transport in boats at 800,000 years ago. Structures and settlements, uh, of course our best hope would be stone structures. The pyramid, the earliest Egyptian pyramid is 4700 BP. The Cairn of Barmenes uh, in uh, France is 6800 BP. Wall City of Jericho, 8800. And the st sanctuary of Gobleki, Gobekli Tepe is 11th century, 11th millennium BC. So we're not getting the dates back there to the 20,000, but I'll show you why there, that may not be such a problem. Um, and now let's look at the human implications. In the Bosphorus and Dardanelles, there would have been uh, four transshipment points because you would have walked, uh, when it's dry, you would have walked from uh, the Black Sea to the, to the Lake of Marmara, and then again from the Lake of Mar Marmara over to the Aegean. There would have been four transshipment points. Maybe there were ports, ports in the Sea of Marmara, minor ports, and maybe an even larger one in the Gulf of Soros. We don't know. We'd have, we should look. Uh, human implications for the Strait of Malacca. The distance to go around that obstruction is almost twice the distance without it. Now let's go to the, the Isthmus of Suez. This is the one that really gets interesting because there are better alternatives. If we look at the normal route through the Red Sea uh, in the 7th century to 1869 when the canal was built, the standard route was to uh, sail through the Red Sea to the end of the Gulf of Suez and then an overland hike of about 150 kilometers from a town called Arsinoe no, uh, to Pelusium. There was also a, a <coughs> crossing from the Nile over to that land route uh, which was uh, sometimes aided by a canal uh, but this goes way back 550 BC to 767 BC, CE. Um, <clears throat> there was another route that was surprisingly popular uh, throughout the Middle Ages to go, get off at Swakin and go across to Wadi Halfa, a 700 mile journey. Well, why did that route even compete? It's so long and such a uh, out of the way. Well, it's because this area north of Swakin, uh, particularly Fowl Bay and, and the coast on to, Aqua, on to Suez was extremely dangerous. It was treacherous because of, of uh, coral, coral reefs, and so dangerous that they would rather hike overland that far than go uh, up, say, to Fowl Bay. And it was a narrow sea with north, is a north, narrow sea with north-south orientation, which means you need to know your longitude, and they didn't know their longitude back in those days. It was only 1769 when the problem of longitude was solved, and, and even longer than that until I started using it. Now let's look at back what, what the LGM route would have been. Uh, certainly all of these same routes would have been available to them, but there were very good alternatives from Fowl Bay over to the Nile. 
that was 600 kilometers by land and then 11, well, 1,050 kilometers by river. And there were three different routes. Uh, the, the third one there was uh, mainly in the Roman era, as far as we know today. But it was, uh, these are uh, ideal options to get away from that 520 kilometer hike to the north. Look at the strategic position now, that foul bay. It would have been an entrepot, a principal transshipment location, city, port, or trading post where goods are imported and exported, stored, and traded. It would have been uh, the most outstanding crossroads the world has ever known for most, any movements from the whole Red Sea, Indian Ocean, Pacific world to the Atlantic Ocean, Mediterranean world. So let's look at Foul Bay. You see it on the left at 20,000 BP and today at, uh, with, uh, filled with water and there is a small town named Berenice there. Berenice today is a small town with port and military airport facilities, sheltered from the Red Sea by Ras Banas. It served as a port of call for the U.S. Sixth Fleet in the early months of the Persian Gulf War. Foul Bay has been prominent from the very earliest times. It was one of the 8,000 registration points that Ptolemy used in his geography in 150 CE. Even if, if you look on Google Earth today, you will see it listed as Berenice Troglodytica. There were three Berenices, Berenice Epidiri and Berenice Pancrisia, which were farther south, uh, not as well known, uh, not, uh, not as certain about where their locations were. And study in this area is confounded greatly because the, uh, because the, um, British Empire in uh, 1899 allowed Sudanese nomads to cross over and this became administratively part of Sudan. And there are other areas that went the other way, but this one has created a, a real problem in recent years. Uh, it's now back in Egypt's hands, but it's uh, not open in the way you'd like for it to be. And uh, my brother tried to get there in 1996, I think it was. He went through 41 military checkpoints and never got to that place. So our new paper, we postulate that closure of the Gulf of Suez due to low sea level during the last glacial maximum caused a dramatic shift in travel routes between the Red Sea and Mediterranean Sea. A city at Foul Bay likely became an entrepot and crossroads of antiquity, later inundated and lost except for subsequent vestiges adjacent to the rising bay. We suggest came, naming it Berenice Aquaterra. The standard account of Berenice Troglodytica is that it became a port in 20, 275 BCE. It was named by Pharaoh Ptolemy II for his mother Berenice I of Egypt. It was prominent for a while as a transshipment po point for African elephants heading for, uh, from present Eritrea to Lower Egypt for military use against the Seleucid Empire. It was active as an east-west connection between the Red Sea and the Nile River in the first and second centuries CE and again in the fourth century CE. It was noted by geographers Strabo, Pliny the Elder, Ptolemy, Stephanus of Byzantium. The port was abandoned after the 6th century CE and all three roads fell into disuse. Berenice itself disappeared until 1818 when its ruins were identified by Belzoni, confirming an early opinion by Danville. All right, I'm going to show you an animation. I hope I'm showing you the animation. Yeah, this is an animation of the filling of Foul Bay. And you'll notice that it starts out fairly slowly, and toward the end, it starts right there, it starts expanding. 
the water very rapidly. So, so here it is as time slices. And when you look at this, you can see that it held most of its land up until um, at least 10,000, well, let's say at least 14,000 BP. Generally, most of it in, by 10.5. It's only after 7,000 BP that it truly uh, becomes a, a strip, uh, merely a strip left. And by 6,500 BP, it's all gone. The land is gone. So that point where stone buildings exist ev elsewhere, so we would not be, find it surprising to find them at 11, I mean, excuse me, at 14,000 BP. Now this is the Isthmus of Suez in those same time slices, and you see here that it uh, had finally filled about 8,000 BP, but even then the northern uh, coast had not expanded. So uh, we can call it 8,000 BP when this becomes the proper overland trek to, to make. And that's compared, I'm going back to Fowl Bay now, and you see that compares with this period in here where basically that port is not needed anymore in Fowl Bay. Is there any physical evidence of ruins in Fowl Bay? Well, hypothesis one is this. We hypothesize that if Fowl Bay contains stone structures in shallow water, they will be expressed today as patch coral reefs. If Berenice Aquaterra existed as a large port city and entrepot, then patch coral reefs will be extensive. The rational, rationale behind that is that corals require a solid substrate. It's essential. Hence, every freestanding reef must be anchored to a natural rock or a stone structure of some type. All right, yeah, this season. Not every reef will cover a building, but at this li latitude, every stone building will be covered by a reef. This is what a Sudanese pyramid looks like. I've exaggerated this one. This is what it would look like underwater. It would have a coral reef on top of it and a sandy bottom around it. And then you can compare that, you can find evidence of it on nautical charts because nautical charts have to show danger. They have to show wherever a reef comes close to the surface. Even if they don't show that much detail on the bottom, they'll always have a mark where something comes to the surface. And uh, so I use this edition of the, na the nautical charts, uh, DMA at that time. I just put this in to show their large uh, sheets. This one's roughly equivalent to a table. Um, and then uh, when we look at those in closer detail, you begin to see the, they call rocks awash, the ones that are um, so um, close to the surface that they actually create a, a shoal. And that would be like some of these down here. And then this one, you can read this as being the coral tip is 10 meters beneath the surface and the nearby bottom is 60 meters. So that's about a 50 foot, uh, meter spire. And I did that for the whole world. And that's what led me to Fowl Bay. I found that uh, Fowl Bay stood out as the largest concentration of patch coral reefs on Earth. And these are my notes from it in that first and second round on the world. Rocks are all over. Some regular geomatic metric patterns in 30 to 64 meters of water. Dense, impressive, no doubt why sailors dubbed it foul for shipping. Some formations are straight or slightly curving lines. Most run parallel to the coast. Most clusters could ha have been physical or cultural, long fringing reefs that seem natural are scattered about, interspersed in shallow water, a total count of 306 coral reefs. And there are the, 
the 306 coral reefs. So from 20,000 BP to 6,500 BP, total population in Fowl Base Basin surely declined as land, roads, and buildings were lost to rising water. The city's port function diminished as traffic shifted back to the rapidly shortening Suez route. Vestiges of the old city immigrated, migrated upward one contour at a time, retaining any high ground that continued to be viable near the shore. Hence, if the city once occupied much of the basin and migrated erratically in the horizontal dimension, depending on hypsometric, which is the vertical patterns, then its precise location may have confounded subsequent geographers who were unaware of the inundation process that had occurred much earlier. Thus, we hypothesize that great uncertainty may have prevailed, and ancient maps likely will show diverse opinions about the location of Berenice. So here's a geographical test. I examined 46 ancient maps of the Red Sea that contain the basin and, and Pal Bay. It's the Monumenta Cartographica Africae at Egypti, edited by Yosef Kamal. And it's a 16 volume atlas, copies of the oldest known maps of Egypt, Africa, and the Red Sea. Only a few copies exist in the world. I examined one at the AGS Library in 2018 and another at the Egyptian Geographical Society in 1999. So this is just to show you uh, a, the kind of a selection of the kinds of maps I was dealing with. And I analyzed them and put them into a table with topics like original cartography, uh, epoch of the map, epoch of the content, uh, translation or interpretation, and does Berenice show, does Foul Bay show, where is Bal Foul Bay, north end, south end, or middle of the... So taking photographs and extensive notes, I analyzed Foul Bay, and in particular the location of Berenice, I found that indeed much confusion exists among cartographers about the location of Berenice within the basin. Of 46 maps, 39 show Berenice, and Foul Bay, and of those, 17 place Berenice at the north end of the bay, 18 place it in the middle, and six place it in the south end. Two maps even su suggest multiple alternative sites. One shows Berenice in the north and south, and a cartographer's note says, Berenice according to the opinion of some geographers. At least we're a thought authoritative at some time. Another shows Berenice in the south and north, and a note says position attributed to Berenice. So the conclusion, confusion is pervasive, and it's clearly stated as scholarly uncertainty by two separate teams of cartographers. You might say the null hypothesis of little confusion is rejected. This is just to show you what that, the, this is the one that says Berenice in the north, and then Berenice according to the opinion of some geographers in the middle. Conclusions, global choke points changed dramatically over the past 20,000 years. Whatever trade, transport, and travel existed 20,000 years ago was substantially rerouted afterward. The most conspicuous beneficiary at LGM would have been Foul Bay, many sites worldwide warrant new seafloor explorations, Foul Bay and Berenice Aquaterra deserve great attention. Circumstantial evidence strongly supports the likelihood of a substantial settlement in the bottom of Foul Bay. However, circumstantial evidence alone is not sufficient to conclude that human built strut features exist. Definitive proof will require a phased exploration of Foul Bay in search of submerged structures and settlements. Phase one should test many selected patch coral reefs for substrates suggesting human-built structures. If structures are found, phase two should survey the entire bay for human settlements and should map settlement forms. If substantial human settlements are found, phase three should expand the exploration to cover larger and farther regions throughout Aquaterra. And geographers should take a leading role in the study of Aquaterra, roughly equivalent to oceanographers, and in collegial collaboration with them.
Thank you. Entertain questions. So, happy to have any questions uh, from people who are here. People who are not here don't ask questions. Yes. Oh, what's the mic? We'll have to. David Mandula, our microphone caddy. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. So, my first question is how the upper is sensitive to the sea level rise because there's still a debate on how sea level rise will actually in the future. How the Antarctic ice melting will contribute to the sea level rise. And uh, I think there's a paper in the PNS told that there will be huge differences between the North American to the South American, the sea level rise in emerging regions in the land surface will be different. So how do you justify the sea level rise uh, to your area of the aqua terra region? And the second one is just our group is working on the Allen Coral Atlas project. We will map all the, all the coral reefs globally by using the high spatial resolution satellite images. So I think that will provide more information about the patch reef for your research in the future. We're working on that. Yeah, thank you. So you're asking why would we use uniform elevation rises around yeah, the, yeah, the world? Yeah. We take our data directly from the, the experts in that field, this Lambeck that I mentioned, uh, is recognized all over for that. Now, if you think, if, if people are saying he's wrong, then we've got a problem, but we're relying on the best available data to do that. I honestly don't think, though, that it could make enough difference to change whole uh, conclusions about what's submerged and what isn't. It, it, it would not be that great a difference. Yes. I would like to know the article that you wrote to the Sure. This is just for the recording. It's going out to the world. <laughs> Sir, I would like to know the name of the article uh, that you wrote with uh, the uh, ocean geographers, uh, the, the Italian ones, uh, Spad and Glassy. I would like to know the name of that article. <laughs> well, the name of it is, is uh, Global choke points may link human settlements at the uh, LGM at 20,000 years ago. But you have to realize that one has been submitted. It has not been accepted yet. We certainly hope it'll get accepted, but um, it is not out there yet to, so to acquire. It, I mean, is it published? Can we find it online? No, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. not on, oh. not yet. Yeah, no, this gives me a nice rest between <laughs> as they're going from one to the other. Hi, Jerry. Ian Walker. I'm a hey. coastal geomorphologist yeah. here in the department, so I, I'm very interested in your work. We've done some work in coastal British Columbia, which is a geographically constrained point that recent archaeological evidence has shown yeah. to be probably out-trumping the inland migration route for early peopling yeah. of the North Americas. We've written a couple papers on regional sea level history in the area, and one of the interesting things that's popped out is that there are locations in these geographically constrained zones that have experienced huge relative sea level changes, partly because of the variety of tectonic and glacioisostatic settings. But there are other areas that are very small that remained terra firma, if you like, whilst there was a, a balance, or what we call a hinge point, between relative sea level change and the glacioisostatic yeah. effect. So I'm wondering if, in, in the modeling of things, any other locations like this popped up where, yes, you could have 50 kilometers away, 100 meters of sea level change, but not too far away from that very location. Do you already know that that's not due to your st isostatic adjustment? Is or well, it's a balance it between glacioisostatic <laughs> rebound, mantle viscosity and thickness, and the rheological effect of that with the rate of relative sea level rise. But so it, there's a spot that's about 15 It still 000. looks like an anomaly though, you're saying. Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking yeah. you if you found <laughs> other areas in the modeling where you, know, you have these little seeming anomalies pop up where if you balance the crustal motions with the oceanographic motions, there's little change. I don't know of any, but I, I don't think I would have discovered it. I think my co-authors would have and or might have and I can certainly ask them and see if they, 
they've done the whole world, so they should be able to look at a place and decide. Yeah, it's probably areas where the crust is really thin, it's really hot, and it's very malleable, yeah. and that that would keep pace with these, these yeah. changes. Yeah. Thanks. And thank you. I'll, I'll, we'll check on that. Hi, hey. Jerry. Um, can you help me understand, you, you use phrases like ports, and I look at some of your dates, and are you suggesting that there were what we would call a town or a city in these places as early as 20,000 years ago? Well, there are two answers there. Uh, the, perhaps we should say that we just don't know what's there. And we shouldn't, we can't dismiss, because when I, that was why I was offering those from literature. There were boats available somewhere in the world. There were uh, stone buildings back to 11,000. I didn't say that their buildings were at 20,000. I said if they were back at 14 even. But they that would there. push dating of cities back. Oh, certainly. The best yes. part yeah. of. We're definitely 10, talking years. about we're talking about mind-boggling earlier dates for many things. If this is true, yes, no question. But you don't have archaeological evidence. I said that. I said I didn't. Yeah, I okay. said uh, all I have is circumstantial evidence, and it would take this kind of deep water excavation to. Because I mean, if, if you read any of the let's call it encyclopedia definitions of urbanization. In Mesopotamia, we're going back maybe 3,500 BC or so. Yeah, right. You're doubling at least that. Uh, that doesn't, I mean, you can't, you can't shy away from that. If this uh, land had the kind of movements that it should have had, then we have to be alert to the possibility. I'm not I think it would be foolish to start saying it was really a city and had people in it if we don't have direct observation, but I, I think we have to look at the, we have to accept the possibility that it's there. But I mean, using that logic, we could accept the possibility that there were cities a million years ago. Well, <laughs> what's wrong with that? I mean, if they were there. <laughs> but, Yeah. Uh, would there have been enough forest close by to Foul Bay that they could have built structures with wood? Well, they could have built structures with wood, but we wouldn't find them today. They'd right. Be, that's why I was sticking with stone. Right. So if there was, I, I guess what I'm asking is if there was evidence that that area was not forested at that time, then you'd have a higher chance of finding maybe stone structures. Mm -hmm. um, no, I agree with you, but uh, I, I think my main role in this is to convince people to take a serious look at the place. And if we look at what happens with most exploration, it's, it's very um, happenstance as to where people go. And there's really no overall strategy of where to look for things in the ocean. And that's what we're offering here, is an overall strategy. Time for one more. Yes. Right. Do, you th do you think right now it's going to be a lot more difficult to uh, study Aquaterra due to political conflicts around the world? It, well, yes, and, and one of them is right there at Foul Bay. And I have been in communication with the there's a team of archaeologists there now, and they tell me that uh, they have no flexibility. They can't look in the water. Um, the, uh, it's very, the, the government is very sensitive about that area. So that's a, it's a direct effect there. Um, there are other places in, in the map that you know, might entice you to look, but I, I'm just focusing on the ones that seem the strongest right now. Yes. So 
own submarine there? Would that would that be like good QBS? Thing? Could they send a drone? Well, there? they have they drone have such submarine. things. They're they're expensive, um, and I did have some interest uh, from one person at uh, Woods Hole, and then he kind of shied away. So. Uh, when you propose something like this, you, you hope to link up with other people who have special skills or knowledge that you don't have. And I've done that with the oceanographers, but not yet with any archaeologists. Okay. Well, for someone who looks a lot like Ernest Hemingway and who's got a <laughs> twin brother who looks just the same, who's at, I want to th thank you all for coming. This is a very interesting topic. I, I think we've really got a lot of... Uh, Fascinating information to go forward with, and, and I hope that you all enjoyed this. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you very much.